From WJCT Studios in Jacksonville, Florida, I'm Ray Hollister. And I'm Elizabeth Pampalone, and for Tom Braun. And this is Deemable Tech, tech help worth listening to. This week's episode of the Deemable Tech Podcast is brought to you by A Small Orange Homegrown Hosting, a refreshingly different approach to web hosting on the web at asmallorange.com. So, Tom is out again. Uh, this time he, he did give us some notice, so I asked our friend Elizabeth Pampalone to give us a hand, and she was gracious enough to help. Thanks for coming in, Elizabeth. I'm happy to be here. And actually, you know, Elizabeth, you, you did almost all of the work getting ready for this show. You're, you're really giving Tom a run for his money here. <laughs> I, actually, I tell you what, I'll, I'll hire you uh, for, I don't know, how about half of what I pay Tom? And that is? Nothing. I'll have to think about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, well, so if you're watching the video stream, uh, you may see that this is actually the ginger episode. Uh, if you've seen, or if you've seen our show before with Elizabeth has been on, uh, we're both redheads. So that's really not as interesting as I thought it would be to say <laughs> when I said it out loud, it's really not that much fun, but it, it's kind of fun. Uh, you know, there's not ma- very many of us. So every now and then when you see another one, it's like, Hey, look, that person's like me. <laughs> it's an anomaly. It is. But before we jump into the show, could I ask you a favor? Not you, Elizabeth, uh, the listeners. Um, can I? Okay, thanks. Um, would you take a second and tell your friends about Deemable Tech? Uh, especially if you know someone who is interested in learning more about technology. Uh, whether they currently know nothing about technology or you think that this person knows everything about technology. If you think that they like learning about technology, let them know about Deemable Tech and tell them to check out the show. We'd really appreciate it. Also, if you haven't done so already, make sure that you're subscribed to Deemable Tech. Just go to iTunes and search for Deemable Tech, or you can go to deemable.com slash iTunes to take you directly to our iTunes page. And of course, you can also subscribe to our YouTube page, and we're on the Facebook and the Twitter. So you can just search for Deemable Tech and find us there. And if you have a question about your computer, smartphone, tablet, or the internet, you can give us a call at one 888 972 Nine eight six eight, or send us an email at questions at deemable.com. That's right. And hey, folks, time is dwindling down to the end of our Amazon gift card contest. If you've been listening the past couple of weeks or a few weeks, we've been talking about this. All you have to do to enter is answer a few questions about this show, the Deemable Tech Podcast. Just go to deemable.com. That's D E E M A B L E.com. You probably already know the address because you're listening to this show, but I say it anyways. And click the link to take the survey. Uh, You can't miss it. It's the first or second article at the top of every page, Um, but it ends September 30th. So if you're listening to this live, that's tomorrow, Monday the 30th. Uh, So don't wait. Go submit your survey answers right now, even if you're listening to this live. Just go pull up the survey right now because you won't have much time after we finish recording this episode. But don't worry, it's not a trivia contest, like I said before. We just need your opinion on a few questions. Uh, Tell us what you think about it. And don't be afraid to hold back. You can tell us how much we stink, and it won't hurt our feelings. Well, it'll probably hurt Tom's feelings, because, you know, he's a gentle gentle creature, you know. He he bruises easily. Uh, (laughs) But I can take it, so, you know, I'll just keep him myself. Uh, But if if you could take a few minutes and answer our survey, it would really help us out a lot. And just for doing so, you'll be entered to win a $20 Amazon gift card. So, speaking of questions, Elizabeth, what kind of questions do we have today? Well, we have uh, blue screens of death, or what about changing your internet provider without changing your email provider? Also, Facebook photo syncing, how to print from your iPad, and critical critical updates that actually break stuff. Oh, excellent. All right, well, let's start with blue screens of death. We got an email from Judy. She said, hi, saw your article in Folio about blue screens of death. Awesome. Thanks for reading uh, our articles in Folio Weekly. Uh, If you're not in Jacksonville, you can also find them in a lot of alternate news weeklies in your area. And if you don't, you should write your editor and ask him, hey, why don't you carry Deemable Tech? And then, you know, have him contact me, rayhollister at deemable.com. And we can get in your local news, alternate news weekly as well. I write better than I talk. <laughs> so anyway, she goes on to say, I'm getting a lot of unexpected shutdowns, four in the last week, and service hangups, 15 last week. Uh, Microsoft speak about drivers might as well be Greek, given how little I know about computers. What should I do to address it? How serious is this? And thanks so much. 
Let me throw that to you. What do you think she should do? Do you think this is a serious issue? I mean, should she be worried about getting four shutdowns in the last week, 15 service hangups in the last week? I have one piece of advice. What's Call that? a tech immediately. Yeah. <laughs> ASAP. I mean, obviously, uh, I'm, I'm praying you already have a backup plan. You already got your files backed up because one of these is going to be it. I mean, you're having many strokes, basically. <laughs> And you're wondering whether or not you should go to the hospital uh, and, and not, please don't take that disrespectfully. I mean, we, but seriously, like this is a big deal. I mean, you're having little heart attacks and, and you're wondering if, if you should get help. Yeah, right now. I mean, if, if you were able to look at the blue screens of death and get the codes from them and you can Google search those and they'll give you an idea of what's going on. We really can't give you much more advice without knowing what those said. Um, but just in general, if you're having four in a week or 15 service hangups, yeah, you've got a big problem and you need to contact somebody as soon as possible. Um, of course, Elizabeth runs, uh, Jack's, uh, Jack's help computer me out. chick. Jack's yes. computer chick. I was about to say the name of another company. <laughs> um, but, uh, also we have our business directory at deemable.com. Uh, you can check that out as well if you're not in the Jacksonville area. And, and and maybe you don't want to go to Elizabeth. There's other companies here in Jacksonville that are good too, um, <laughs> like the one that I almost mentioned. <laughs> but uh, definitely call somebody soon um, and, and yes. have that looked at. Um, if you haven't already uh, – actually, that's the first thing you should do, period. Uh, jump on that and, and contact a tech and have them take a look at it because there, there could be serious issues. And you know what happens when your computer crashes, it's all gone, or it could be all gone. So you need to get, jump on that soon. That's an emergency. Get it to the emergency room. Mm-hmm. All right. Absolutely. All right. So we have another email from Walter. Can you read that one? It's actually a voicemail. Oh, voicemail. That's right. Yeah. Uh, my name is Walter. Uh, I live in Ponte Vedra Beach. Uh, my question is about changing um, internet service providers. Uh, I, I want to know if there's any way that I can retain my current email address, which is in a bellsouth.net uh, provider, mm. uh, if I was to switch to Comcast, for example. That is, by doing something, of establishing a subsidiary account or something of that nature. Or if there is uh, some type of service that will forward emails from one account to another for a certain period of time. Um, of course, I'm also hooked up with a you know Gmail account on my phone, but that's not oh. a problem. You know, me mating that up with a new with a new email address. I'm just concerned about all of the business that I conduct. You know, they they base um, your access to your accounts on on what email address you're coming from. All right. So, I'd appreciate your advice on this. Thank you for your advice. Goodbye. Okay. All right. So let me make sure I understood. He has Bell South right now. Yep. And he's looking at switching mm-hmm. to another internet service provider. And he wants to see if he can keep his email address or just move it to the new email address without losing any emails. That's what it sounded like. But um, he, he mentioned that he also has Gmail on his phone, which I'm assuming he probably has an Android device. Probably. Um, so he's got a Gmail account. And that's yes. a good sign. So what would you recommend for him to do here? I actually recommend that the Gmail account be the primary email account. Yeah. And... I don't like having anyone use their ISP, which is Internet Service Provided Emails, right. like a Bell South or a Comcast. Because what happens is if you switch, if you move, it's like a mm-hmm. landline. It stays there with yeah. that company. Um, other than having like a Gmail account, it's like having a cell phone. You can carry it with you. And no matter where you move in the country, you could still take that phone with you. Yeah, because, I mean, you might be lucky enough, like if you're in, in Bell South, you might be lucky enough to where you move has Bell South. Right. but. If it doesn't have Bell South, you're moving to uh, Verizon as your landline. Right. Well, then you can't switch emails. You right. Have to, you'd have to switch completely, and you can't lose, keep your email right, address. Right. You lose whatever you have in your Bell South account. Yeah. So what I recommend for people to do is to go to your Bell South or Comcast, whatever email you're using that's from your internet service provider, and there's a little thing called yeah. options in there. And if you go into option that says forwarding, yes, and you can actually forward your emails just like the post office does with your regular mail. Yep. They forward it to your new address. Your internet service provided email can forward your emails to another address like a Gmail or something like that. And I recommend doing that. It actually eliminates you have being tied to your internet service provider yeah. for any reason. And then as you get emails coming in, as you respond to people, they'll 
get that message that you're using a different email address as you respond to them. And then with companies, like you were mentioning, um, Walter was mentioning about, he does business with companies like maybe he has a Target.com account and sure. he's got a credit card that gets us, he gets a statement or something. And he doesn't, you know, that company's not going to automatically pick up that he has a new email address. Right. So when those emails come through. Even if you send them an email and say, exactly. hey, I got a new email address. <laughs> they'll exactly. be like, good for you. <laughs> yeah, it'll come right back to you. So what I recommend doing is if you're using Gmail especially, mm-hmm. you can tag those incoming emails that are coming from your right. old address are coming to your old address, essentially. And you can say, this is coming to my Bell South account. And your Gmail will pick that up and it can tag it saying, hey, you've got these five emails and they're still emailing you at Bell South. Yeah. And you can switch them from there. Now, the one thing to keep in mind, of course, is that uh, you don't have to pay for this service, but this service ends pretty abruptly when you shut off your service. Correct. So you want to do this before you leave your old service. Give yourself some time to get that transition over uh, to where every, all your personal contacts know your new email address and you've already weeded through the business contacts that you have and the, the company service providers so that you've changed all of your, your uh, email address with them. Yeah, and I recommend doing that even if you're not even thinking about switching right now oh, yeah. or if, even if you're not thinking about moving right now. I would recommend that everybody do that in general so that when that time comes when you do need to switch providers or you do need to move, yep. You're not going to be stuck with this while you're trying to move or switch providers, which can be kind of hectic. Yeah, because with with Gmail or even uh, Outlook.com or uh, Yahoo Mail, you can take it with you. And no matter where you go anywhere in the world, you can still use that same service. And it's not tied to a paid service, and that's the problem with uh, with using your ISP's email address. And it's no disrespect to Bell South or Comcast or Verizon or any of the other service providers. It's just when it's tied to that, uh, nowadays, your email address is like your calling card. It's your business contact and personal contact that everyone uses. And if you can't take it with you, eh, you get kind of tied up. So it is a good idea to move to a free service that you don't that you can take with you no matter right. where you go. All right. Well, I think we have another voicemail, and it's from someone that you know. And yes. actually, we know too. Uh, he's called us before. Hi. Uh, this is Marvin here in Jacksonville. I've asked you this question before, but I'm not quite getting the answer you gave me. I want to print out my address book. I'm on a HP Computer Presario SR1930 NX, and I'm using Windows XP. And my address book is obscured by uh, on the right half by... Uh, part of the address book proper. On the left, I can print out the names, but uh, a lot of the information is hidden behind the other half of the page. I don't know if I explained that well or not. Yeah. Thanks. That's pretty good. Okay, so yeah, we did actually, me and Tom uh, answered this question uh, back in episode 45, it was a uh, Deemable Tech and the Podsters was the name of the episode back way back in August. Um, and we totally answered it wrong, uh, as sometimes happens, um, uh, you know, because we were, we were really guessing what was going on here. Um, we figured that it might have something to do with his printer, his setup, the way he had his printer set up. Um, but it turns out you actually know Marvin, um, yes. and you've helped him out with this issue. What what did it turn out to be? What was the, the problem he was well, having? Well, he's actually using um, a webmail version, okay. you know, like Yahoo, AOL, something like that. And so when you go online, um, whether you're on a website or you're in your email online, there's usually the word print or a printer icon on that page. Right. Even if you're printing an email, if you're trying to print the address book, if you're trying to print your calendar, whatever it is, if it's webmail or some kind of web-based program, it usually has a, the word print or an icon. Instead of clicking file print, which is what he was right. essentially doing. So he wasn't printing the item he wanted off of the web. He was actually printing the web page itself, which oh. gives you all those ads and all that stuff on the top and the sides. You know, it's not in the notes, but I think I mentioned that because I think I think I was thinking there must be some sort of ad or something that was covering what he was concerned about. Uh, I just vaguely remember that. It was months ago, so I could be wrong, but or I could just be making up that memory. <laughs> but I think that's what I, I thought it could be. So you, you told him basically to hit 
print on the on the, the, on the web page, correct? Which then formats it correctly for what the content that you're printing out. Right. Makes a lot of sense. It would be just the same as if you were I think Chrome actually works around that, but like if you were going to menu and print on a document, it might print out the whole thing instead of just the document that you wanted to print. Right. right. I think I think Chrome works that out and doesn't print out the menu. <laughs> Chrome does. Google yeah. Chrome, the browser, does actually do that. Um, but if you're using Internet Explorer, which I believe he was, oh yeah, um, that will always give you all those ads and it's all the print menus. And everything stuff. on the website. Yep. Makes sense. Okay. Well, we have to take a quick break. Uh, when we come back, we have more of your questions about the Facebook uploads and. Uh, we actually have a two-for-one question coming up, too. This is Deemable Tech. Welcome back to Deemable Tech. I'm Ray Hollister. And I'm Elizabeth Pampelone. All right, well, let's take some more questions here. Let's see, where are we at? Uh, we got one from Catherine. She writes, I have an iPhone 5, and every time I take a photo and try to upload it to Facebook, it keeps adding it to a stream of old photos, and the comments from friends are all from the old photos. How do I get this to stop and just upload one photo at a time in a post? What do you think about this? Well, what's going on here? Facebook has tried to make it so easy for you to upload photos that they have something called Facebook Photo Sync. Yes, that's true. And they've decided that if you go on Facebook and if you touch, yes, I want to sync my photos, it's actually going to sync every photo you take with your iPhone right into your Facebook account into a special little folder they have set up there. Okay. So what do you what do you think about this? Should Should she be... I mean, she doesn't want to for all of her photos to go into that stream. Um, you think she should just turn that off, or what should she do? You can turn it off if you go to the Facebook app on your phone. You can go to the Photos section and go to Synced, mm -hmm. um, and you can actually turn it off. If you don't, have never turned it off or turned it on, it will actually ask you if you want to turn it on, so yeah. it'll be sitting there waiting for you. But I say no, don't do it. Every photo you post becomes kind of a property of Facebook. They can use it yeah. for whatever they want. That's true. Um, and other thing is, sometimes I take photos of really <laughs> stupid things uh, in a store or something I need to remember, and I don't really need all my mom and everybody seeing all this. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, when when I st or uh, the iCloud stream photo stream came out, a lot of people were uh, hooking it up with their Apple TV. And um, some people found out that all of their photos... <laughs> no matter whether they were appropriate for general consumption or not, <laughs> were showing up on their Apple TV. Uh, they quickly turned that off, uh, those people who found that out. Yes. Oh, but, you know, I was looking over this question, and actually, I, 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 know, I see what you're talking about with the, the streaming, because I use that. I have actually, I have Facebook set up to automatically sync all my pictures. I also do that with Google+, and with Dropbox, and with uh, Pogo Plug. Um, and it just automatically pulls all my pictures because I have been the victim of a hard drive crash where I lost most of my daughter's childhood. <laughs> so I'll never face that wrath again. <laughs> <laughs> I want it, every picture backed up. You can actually set it where all of your pictures that are uploaded uh, on Google Plus and Facebook, they're automatically set to private. So, yeah, there's still issues with, you know, Facebook privacy and you know, yeah, they've hacked into it before and, you know, supposedly private pictures ended up not being private. Um, but it, it's enough for me to be, to feel okay with it. But actually, I, I realized that this, uh, Catherine is talking about how, and I've experienced this too, you upload a f just one photo and it goes into an album. And that album, like it actually went in general with Facebook, 
with iOS, it goes into the iOS upload folder. And I don't know how to make it not go into that folder. It has to go into a folder. So well, you might have you to create can, a new folder. Well, you can make it go into a different folder. If you're using the share button in mm -hmm. your iPhone to share it to Facebook, it's right. automatically going to go to a Facebook iOS folder. Right. But you can change that folder to a different folder, well, but you can't create a new folder. Well, you can actually go into the Facebook app and right. upload your photo from there and you can change it. But if you're using the share option that's in the iPhone itself, that's in the yeah. photos section of the iPhone... Uh, in the actual app, then it's only going to put it in the iOS folder. Yeah. Well, so. no, you, oh, you can pick a different folder. Oh, from there you yeah. can. Yeah. Or at least with iOS 7. I know uh, when it first came out with the Facebook integration, it, it that's it. It was only on the one It was folder. only with iOS. 7, you yeah. can. Yeah. But again, though, you can only, it has to go into an album. It's already created. And it has to be an album that's already created. So if you wanted to start a new album, the best way to do it, yeah, I, I agree with you, would be to go into Facebook, the app, mm -hmm. and upload it from there. And then you could put it wherever you wanted to. And because I've had that before where I took a bunch of pictures, uploaded them, and then people were commenting on photo album that I'd uploaded like a year or two ago. I'm like, why are people commenting on this? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that has nothing to do with that. So, yeah, the solution is uh, if you don't want your photos syncing, definitely go into the photo section and go to sync and turn that off. Uh, but if you just want to post one po photo at a time, go in through the, f the Facebook app and that will take care of it. You should be good. All right, now we have our BOGO question, our, our buy one, get one free. Uh, we say that because it's two questions that basically have the same answer. This is kind of nice. Uh, Robert wrote, recently, as I use the back arrow on my Internet Explorer browser to return to a previous page, something strange has happened. Even if I continue to click on the back arrow, I still do not return to the previous web page. After waiting a few moments, I click on the down arrow next to the back arrow, and all that I see are a bunch of web page links that I have never visited. Usually, there's a portion of the links that have something like add.doubleclick. In order to get back to the web page that I want, I have to either open a new web browser page, or I can click on the home link and then type in the URL address all over again. What's going on? And more importantly, how do I block this from ever happening again? And ironically, Bob, not Robert, <laughs> a different person, also wrote... I installed Adblock and it's working fine. However, I still get random audio ads, sometimes playing over audio coming from a YouTube video I'm watching, and other times whilst reading it in email. Is there a solution to block unwanted audio? So what's the solution here? What's going on? Well, sounds like it might have been a browser hack, but it's actually not. Okay. Because sometimes mul um, sites will open multiple windows of ads that can appear in your browser as if you had visited the site multiple times, like the ad.doubleclick. Right. This often happens on ha ad-heavy sites, like sites where you watch TV online and things mm. like that. Um, so for Robert who's getting those, can't go back to the original page. If I'm going to a, open a link like this where I'm on an ad-heavy site, and I know this happens often, I try to right-click on the link that I want to go to before actually going to it, and I use the Open in a New tab. This way, all those ad.double clicks will open in a separate tab, and I have my original spot saved so I can always get back to it by using the tabs instead of using the back button. So for Bob, if you're using um, Google Chrome as your browser, you should be, which you should be, I think. Yeah, but I mean. when you, whenever this is um, happening, you'll actually, Adblock will not show all those pop-ups, but it doesn't actually close them. There will be a box next to your bookmark star, which will have a red X on it. If you click it, you'll see a list of the pop-ups that did not actually pop up. Okay. But instead, they're open in the background. So after a few moments, once those pages fully load on the pop-ups, they'll actually start playing the audio, which can be really annoying because they play after it's been a few minutes. Oh, that is really interesting. <laughs> I had never experienced that because I guess it just doesn't happen on the Chromebook, and that's where I do most of of my my browsing is on my Chromebook and I never see those. Yeah, it happens all the time. I have a Mac and it, I use Google Chrome and I get that box and you can hear the audio playing in the background. Um, and so what you have to do is you have to literally open each pop-up. So if you click on that box, it'll show you the list. You can open each pop-up and close them. Um, sometimes, though, like you were saying, too, mm -hmm. um, you have those audio that's on the page. Mm, you can't yeah. close the ad. It's just there. And you can click the mute symbol or the, you know, little sound symbol, the um, speaker symbol there, and right. it'll mute it. But 
ads have actually gotten a little <laughs> sneaky, and they've yes, actually they started putting the mute symbol. It looks like the mute is on, mm -hmm. but the ad is blasting away. And so what I learned, if you click the mute symbol once, even though it looks like it's muted, it will actually mute it. I actually so. I saw one where the mute button was actually the button to take you to the web page. Wow. I mean, that is sneaky. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you asked uh, Bob, um, is there a solution to block unwanted audio? You could do what I do. I just run on my computer on mute all the time. Mm -hmm. I, I rarely ever turn the audio on unless I'm listening to a video, which you were just saying that uh, with the YouTube videos. Now, with YouTube videos, there are a lot now that start off with a, uh, an ad. Uh, it's usually like 15 seconds. I've, I've seen a few that are 30 seconds. In that, there's really nothing you can do about it. Um, you'd have to just, if, you're, if it's on another web page that you had open, you'd, you'd have to go in there and shut those off individually. So that should take care of you. Um, with Robert, uh, that I, I just didn't realize that that issue with the um, the back going back. I have an ad blocker at work, and I've noticed that when I go to some pages, I can't go back. But I just figured it was because of the way our ad blocker at work did. I didn't realize it was actually pulling up other ads. Yep, and the easiest way, like I said, is to right do a right click and open a yeah. new tab. And I always use that, so I always have my original right there. Now, as a Mac user, how do you right click? Because you don't have two it's mouse actually buttons. Actually, control click. Control click. There you go. <laughs> I, I just I knew you knew, so I thought I'd throw it at you real quick. All right, uh, we have another voicemail from Julie. Uh, my name is Jewel Cross. Jewel. Uh, I've had uh, Clearwire <clears throat> for a few years, and now it's. Um, giving problems it's not i'm not specifically um roku is, is repeating netflix netflix is um continues downloading at night and i've turned this off and tested it on um speedtest.org and i'm not getting enough speed i suppose i'm going to have to swip switch to another server other than Clearwire, and I wonder which is my best choice. Should I go directly to cable, um, or what do you suggest? Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Um, ah, gosh, we've never actually, I don't think we've ever dealt with Clearwire on this show. Um, so we got a couple of pieces of advice for you, Jewel. Um, one is, it sounds like Roku is trying to update the Netflix app. Um, and that may be an issue of, you, you were mentioning that with some Clearwire devices, uh, when we were talking about this before the show, mm -hmm. some Clearwire devices, you can only connect eight devices at a time. Yep. So if you have multiple devices, like an iPad and an iPhone and a laptop and the Roku. And a printer. And a printer, <laughs> yeah. You, you may actually be maxing out the number of devices you can connect to that uh, Wi-Fi hotspot, the, the Clearwire device. Um, that could be the issue. It could just be swapping them out, kind of cycling them, and then it just it starts to download Netflix, the, the app, and then, oh, well, now it's got to do it again, mm -hmm. and it just keeps starting over and over again. Um, the other issue is, how can I say this nicely? Clearwire is terrible. <laughs> um, and, and, and now, actually, Clearwire is almost gone. Uh, Sprint has pretty much taken over Clearwire. That Clearwire became clear. Clear is now pretty much completely run by Sprint. And it's just a hotspot. I mean, so like AT&T or Verizon has their hotspot uh, little devices. So it's not terrible. It really is not a suitable uh, internet provider for uh, your, your main primary internet. It, it's really something that works great if you're mobile. If you need something where you're on the road or you're out at a business meeting and you got to have a hotspot, it's great. And that's what Sprint does well. Uh, but what Clearwire came out of the gate b back in the day uh, to be your home internet provider and it was going to come wirelessly, it just doesn't work. Because just like your cell phone, you don't always get great signal in your house. And that's the problem with Clearwire is that it is basically a digital cell phone connection. You're going on 3G or possibly 4G. Uh, with Clear, it was actually technology that they stopped using called uh, WiMAX. And they've stopped that altogether, but Clear, I think, is still using it. I'm not sure if they've switched over to LTE or not. But it's 
we both had it. Both we were talking about this yes. before the show. We both had it. Uh, when I had it uh, years ago, I, I had a guy convince me to get it, and uh, you know we ran a hundred foot uh, RJ forty five uh, internet cable uh, to the box just to get a signal at all, <laughs> and we were only getting two bars, and uh, we had a bad experience with them. Uh, you know they you are under a two year contract when you sign with with Clearwire uh, or Clear as it is now, but. You're supposed to be able to get out of that if you can't get a signal in your house. So if you can get any signal at all, they can kind of weasel out of it. Um, so if you're out of contract, run. Just get out of it. <laughs> um, and e we were talking about this before the show, too. Uh, as far as what sh which internet provider she should go to, what what is your opinion on that as far as cable or DSL? Well, there's two answers I have for that, actually. Okay. Um, I really, really do like Comcast's reliable internet connection. They have and really a, fast speed. Yeah, and of course, we're talking here in Jacksonville. I mean, in your area, it may be different. Uh, it's possible, you know, you could have a place where that has faster DSL. I've never heard of that place, but <laughs> <laughs> you might. <laughs> well, Comcast here in Jacksonville has pretty good, um, pretty high speeds for, yeah. you know, pretty reasonable amount of money but you are going to pay a little higher than you would for dsl yeah absolutely and so dsl is kind of that middle of the road option whereas you know clear would be kind of the lower end option you're not paying as much per month and it's mobile and things like that but not as reliable yeah dsl is kind of in the middle the at&t company here in town they have a pretty good internet but it's not quite as fast as comcast so if you're yeah. doing a lot of video streaming if you're trying to netflix. do net yeah netflix yeah. especially um, if you're doing any kind of, you know, heavy uploading or downloading, you're going to want something like Comcast. If you can afford Comcast, that's the option I would go with. Yeah. Just make sure you try, if possible, and get new equipment from them. That's true. Because they can be pretty, pretty sneaky about giving you used equipment, which can really mess you up. And we'll, we'll, talk, we'll come back to that. But as far as if you can't afford Comcast, which it is, it can be pretty pricey. Yes. That's when you were saying that. DSL, yeah. to use the DSL. And you don't have to, when you when you call these companies, you don't have to get the big all-in-one package. They have internet-only lines. I know AT&T has what's called a dry DSL line or fast access DSL where you don't have to have cable, you don't or you don't have to have their direct TV, you don't have to have your home phone even. You can just have internet, and it can be a little bit less expensive if you go that route. Yeah. Now, if you are low income, um, if it's, you know, it's really an issue, like, your kids are on the free lunch program, you automatically qualify for actually a nine ninety five plan from Comcast, but it's about the same price as DSL. So uh, you can get DSL for around that same range too. So that is also an option. I mean, you could still get Comcast, but it, it, it's the same speed. So right. it's, you know, six to one, half a dozen the other. Uh, but going back to the equipment, um, something that we found out in my house was that, yeah, we were having the same problem. Our equipment was used and it wasn't working right. And often, I mean, if, again, if you've got the money for Comcast, you probably have the money to go out and buy a cable modem. It's a great investment. Buy that cable modem. You can go to Amazon or eBay, usually, and find a good quality, current, recent, uh, new or gently used uh, cable modem, and you're going to save so much money off of that rental fee. The Comcast combination that I like the best, which is on the little bit of the expensive side, but it is one of the most mm -hmm. reliable combinations, is the Motorola Surfboard. Yes. It's white. They have a new one out. I think it's a 6141. Mm -hmm. And the Apple Airport Extreme. Oh, the Airport Extreme. Yeah. Those That's are the a fantastic two most reliable router. pieces of, of equipment you can yep. get. And, and uh, if you're having problems with your router, <laughs> that is a great option. Yep. It'll fix a lot of those issues for you. So, yeah. Uh, so, Jewel, um, that's what I would do. Uh, if you're out of contract with Clear, run while you still can. <laughs> Don't renew. <laughs> uh, and, and, again, no disrespect to Sprint or Clear. It's just, it's just not the kind of service you want for your house. I mean, you, wanna, you want a wired connection. I mean, wireless is great, but not if you don't have to be. <laughs> yeah, I mean. I agree. You know, if you're out. In the middle of the boonies, and yeah, wireless. If you've got is... that motorhome. Clear is the best thing. Oh for yeah, you. <laughs> oh yeah, no doubt. Yeah, I mean, or if you're in business, you know, and you you gotta have Wi-Fi. Yep. Yeah, but then again, too, you know, we're talking. This is 3G or 4G. You can often have a wireless hotspot with your cell phone. If you've got a smartphone, uh, you can have uh, a wireless hotspot there, and it's about the same quality, about, it's the, about same the same money. speed, about the same money, yep. uh, and you don't have to have a separate device. 
Now, the downside is it's going to burn up your phone battery. So, you know, if you have to use your phone and use the hotspot, then that could be an issue. But so anyways, hope that hope that helps you out. Let's see. We have another voicemail from Scott. My name is Scott. I'm calling from the south side. And uh, uh, my question is I have an iPad that I would like to print uh, my emails. Um, emails. And I'm okay. using, I'm trying to find all these print print apps, and, uh, and none of them will uh, recognize, um, I guess it's called AirPrint, and uh, so I can't print emails. So I'm trying to do that, and I was wondering if you knew of a specific app uh, that did. My printer, I have a um, about a three-year-old Epson printer that is not AirPrint compatible. Uh, okay. So um, my, uh, do I need to get a new printer, or is there an app that will uh, do this? I have an iPad. I'm running um, uh, iOS uh, 6.0, and um, I hope that's all the information that you need. All right. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay, thanks for your question, Scott. Now, uh, Tom and I did actually talk about something similar to this uh, with Google Cloud, uh, Google Cloud Print. And that is basically from any computer that has Chrome on it, you can set your printer up to print remotely from it. So you set it up on your Chrome browser on the computer that's connected to that printer. And it's assuming that your printer has no wireless capabilities whatsoever. You cannot print uh, across the internet. If you can print it all across the internet, you can usually print with Google Cloud automatically. But if you have no wireless capabilities at all, you can set up Google Cloud Print on your Chrome browser that's connected to the computer or the printer that you want to print from. And then you can print from any Android device uh, and most uh, Google apps on iOS And there's a couple of iOS apps that will also give you capability to do that as well. But you actually had a solution that I didn't know about that will allow you to do AirPrint. And AirPrint's the native way that iOS and Apple products uh, print wirelessly. So what was that about? Actually, there's an app that you put on your computer. Mm -hmm. And again, you still have to have that printer that's hooked up directly to that computer if it's right. a laptop or a regular desktop and that computer has to be on for this app to work the app is called colobos c-o-l-l-o-b-o-s and they have a great website and their app is twenty dollars basically you have your computer that's connected to your printer and it could be wireless printer or not it doesn't matter and you put this this great app from uh, colobos on your computer and it basically tells your computer and your printer Play nice with the iPad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And it, it allows you to see from your AirPrint settings anytime you want to print an email from the map application on the iPad or the iPhone, it'll just show that printer up right away. Okay, cool. And There's no ma- extra app needed for the iPad or the iPhone either. Oh, excellent. Because it, so it, it goes directly through mm-hmm. I, through uh, AirPrint. That's great because the, the app that allows you to do Google Print outside of Google Print or Google Apps mm-hmm. is fairly expensive. I think it was like $15. Um, so if this would allow you to do it without an additional app on your iOS device, that's pretty good. Um, I will include a link in our show notes uh, to colobos.com where you can find that. And actually, it's really interesting. I found out that you can also, it also enables uh, Google Cloud Print to work. Yes. So it does kind of dual, du- dual duty there. <laughs> and then, of course, there's always the option of buying another printer, which yep. when your printer's not that old, it's not too bad. But if you're looking yeah. at buying another printer for AirPrint specifically, I would recommend going on the Apple website and finding, looking at the models that they offer. Yeah. And just going anywhere to buy the same exact model that they sure. offer that you want to buy. Or if you have an Apple store nearby, you can just stop by and look at what they have yes. in stock. Um, but yeah, you don't have to necessarily buy it from Apple. Correct. You can buy it from eBay, Amazon, Best, Best Buy, Buy, Staples, Office Tiger Depot. Direct. <laughs> uh, There's a trying to think of, of ones that aren't in the Jacksonville Fries. area. Fries. There you go. New Egg. New Egg. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You can go anywhere as long as it is uh, AirPrint compatible. Uh, then you can print directly from it. And uh, mostly with most of the email apps, there's just an option under menus where you click print and it's going to show those AirPrint enabled printers on your uh, network and then you'll be able to print directly from them. Cool. All right. 
Let's see what else we have. Oh, now we have the fun question. Okay, so <laughs> Joe sent us an email that says, guys, uh, this was to me and Tom, uh, but guys and gal, uh, I am at my wits end regarding a Microsoft critical update that just won't install. It has failed over and over again on my Windows 7 laptop. I have tried everything mentioned in the Microsoft knowledge base and on TechNet. Nothing works. This includes downloading the critical update separately and trying to install it, using the Microsoft Fix-It tool, using a hotfix utility to fix win Windows update, using the SFC command to find repair missing files, etc. I have shut down my firewall, turned off my AV program, and even tried or antivirus program, and even tried to install the critical update in safe mode. The update is apparently critical to security as it updates the kernel to remove some vulnerability. What I don't understand is why Microsoft gives you a cryptic error message on the fail that doesn't tell you anything. Well, I can tell you why. They've been doing that for the past 20 years. <laughs> Microsoft always gives you a cryptic error message that you have to figure out what it is. But the update is KB2850851, and the error I get is 800736B3. Yeah, very useful information. Um, no, I'm not joking at you, Joe. I'm, I'm joking at Microsoft. The laptop is an HP DV7 with Windows 7 64-bit. It's about 18 months old, and I haven't had any problems with it until now. I run WebRoot Secure Anywhere for antivirus and the built-in security essentials from Microsoft. Thanks. I got to say, Joe, that is a fantastic question. It's a fantastic question because you covered everything. You have diagnosed this to the minutia. And I know it's a good question because I don't know the answer. So, <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth, I turn to you. Do you know the answer to this? To I've Joe's actually problem? dealt with this. Oh, okay. Uh, exact. I know all these letters and numbers don't mean anything <laughs> to anybody else but me. Um, and Joe, of course. Yeah. Um, well, Joe, let me tell you. The only two options that you have, really, because I've done everything you've done, too, with the whole Microsoft knowledge base and everything, um, the only two options you have is to install another operating system, like Ooh. Windows 7 Premium, Windows oh. 7 Ultimate. I thought you were going with, like, Linux or Mac. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we could throw the whole thing out. but uh. um, Or to go back and revert your system in a, a system restore to a, the previous version that was you know good before all these critical updates started happening right and once you're at that other version turn off all your automatic updates and Ooh. just not update at all but this is a critical update i mean it's critical and it's an update he has to do it right <laughs> <laughs> for some of my customers uh what i've done is just had them not update um some of the things that stop listening stop <laughs> listening to her <laughs> But, you know, it may we be that you We tell our listeners to always update. This is terrible <laughs> well, advice, Elizabeth. Well, sometimes you do need to update, and that's why I'm saying. But for some reason, with this HP build She's and the one... She's never coming back on the show. <laughs> I'm never letting her back on the, the show The one yet. that I was working with and this particular build you're working with, there's uh, some interaction between the hardware and this critical update. Okay. And, like, the the BIOS, it's, some, it's a video card. Something is happening, yeah. and I wasn't ever able to pinpoint it. Yeah. So it's one of those things where... You have to redo your system where you have to put on a different operating system so that it won't have that update, critical update issue, or not update. Yeah. Basically, what this is is, and this is the problem with, it's not Microsoft's fault. It's just the way the Microsoft business works is that Microsoft has to make an operating system for everything. I mean, they literally run on Macs. They run on every computer that exists, except for, well, I guess you could probably put it on a Chromebook. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you... Because of that, they can't possibly cover every possible hardware combination. And when you're writing an operating system, it's so complicated to deal with each piece of hardware and make sure everything works. So unfortunately, just don't get it. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, sometimes something slips through and it just doesn't work. Now, you, the one, the computer you were dealing with was a desktop, desktop. computer. Was it an HP? It was. It was an HP. Yes. Okay, and this one was an HP as well. And it was about the same age. Oh, okay. It was around the same time frame. So what you need to do is hound Microsoft <laughs> and HP to yes. fix this update. Because HP kind of has some ownership of that problem as well because it's their hardware. 
Um, but yeah, unfortunately, ugh, you got to either switch to a different version of Windows, switch to Linux. <laughs> <laughs> you can't put Mac OS on there. Uh, you can, but it's not. Don't do that. It's not good. Um, or you're going to have to restore back to an old uh, version of it, uh, do a restore point, and then <laughs> wait until Microsoft comes out with a fix that fixes the fix. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. So far, so, not yet. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's crazy. All right. Well, we have another email from Ray. I think this is the other Ray. I don't think I wrote this one. <laughs> we uh, There is uh, a Ray that writes in periodically. He wrote, let's see, randomly and occasionally, the computer will not wake from sleep state. I have looked at the event log for this. The results were a uh, critical error message. The last sleep transition was unsuccessful. This error could be caused if the sleep system stopped responding, failed, or lost power during the sleep transition. Windows Vista Home Premium. Going to event log online <laughs> help reveals nothing useful. <laughs> Results for a Microsoft product, Windows operating system, blah, 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 blah. Uh, as we were just talking about before, uh, cryptic messages yes. that don't mean anything to, to us at all. This is not helpful. This failure occurs less than once a month. The solution that he, he's figured out, the other Ray figured out, is a hard reboot uh, using the power switch to turn off and turn on the computer. Have you tried turning it off and on again? Yeah, he did. Uh, then it works fine for several months. The hardware diagnostic tool scans or shows that the hard, although the hardware, excuse me, the hardware diagnostic tool scan shows that all the hardware is working. Since it happens rarely and randomly, it would be difficult to troubleshoot. Any suggestions? The computer is up to date regarding service packs and other updates, and updating the BIOS did not help. The mouse and none of the buttons on the keyboard do not wake the computer. Hibernation is not enabled for this computer, only sleep state. Since this is an infrequent random error, perhaps the only solution is to give the computer a hard reboot when necessary. Thank you for your assistance. Another great question. Uh, well well uh, researched and uh, definitely didn't, you know, I, I tried the old adage, have you tried turning it off and yes. on again? And that <laughs> apparently is the only solution that works. So what did you find out about this one? Well, I did some research on it and I know I'm the, the really doing bad here with this whole not updating thing, uh -huh. but... The actually one of the solutions that people are actually having luck with was actually reverting to an old version of your motherboard BIOS. Okay. So going backwards, not updating, but unupdating. Yeah. <laughs> now, for for most of our listeners, uh, updating your BIOS is pretty intense. Yes. Um, your BIOS is for for our listeners who aren't familiar with this at all. When you are booting your computer, you see all the text usually going across. You usually see the logo that comes up first, and you'll see. F9 to go into settings or delete to go into settings, something like that. That actually takes you into the BIOS menu. If you go in there, tread carefully. That's the easiest way to actually break your computer mm -hmm. really good. Um, it can usually sometimes still be fixed, but you can actually break it pretty, pretty good in there. Um, so if you're not familiar with that, you probably want to stay away from it. Unless you're like, hey, let me uh, let me break my computer. And call a tech if you're not yeah, sure. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Call a tech. Unless you are ready and willing to break your computer. And, yes. And you just want to do that and goof around with it. We always encourage people to, to you know, break it if you want to. Yes. <laughs> if you're willing to break it, go for you it. You bought it, you break it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but otherwise, yeah, you're going to want to contact a tech uh, that can help you out with that. Um, but there was another issue that you thought might be, that could be the problem. Because I mean, we are talking about somebody who is pretty tech savvy here. Yes. What could that be? The other issue that I saw that it might be and could possibly be solved is over. you might be overclocking your ATI card. Okay, explain and what that means for our, our listeners. That, you know, I don't know. It's a, the ATI card is your <laughs> no, graphic card. Yes, it's your video oh, card. So right. if, you're, if you're running something that's really intense, and you may also notice this if it's happening randomly you may actually kind of watch for that if you're using your video card really intensely at one point and then all of a sudden it won't wake from sleep after that right that might be the issue and of course intensely if you're like uh, what do you mean intensely if you're using it for gaming or streaming or streaming video, video you'll, mm -hmm. you'll that's that is going to work can, your graphic card yes. hard yeah. um, or if you're doing any video editing mm -hmm. video editing will will Kill a graphic oh, card yes. or work a graphic <laughs> card the hardest, I think, of any yes. possible work you can do on a computer. 
um, but also uh, sometimes photo editing can kind of can kind of tax it. You're doing any um, kind of um, illustrating or yeah, um, illustrating three yeah. D co- rendering compiling. Three D rendering like will that. do it. Yeah, if you're doing CAD drafting mm-hmm. on there. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you do any of those things, um, you probably already know. You're like, oh, you're you're probably listening, going, oh, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if Hopefully. you don't do any of those things, you're probably like, uh, I don't even know what you're talking about. And then it's probably, that's probably not the issue. Yeah. Uh, it's probably the motherboard BIOS. So, okay. Yeah. So uh, good luck with that. Um, again, telling our, telling our listeners not to update. <laughs> oh, I try to be helpful. <laughs> no, it, you know, and, and it is true. Sometimes that is the right solution. Like we were talking about before the show uh, with iOS 7, uh, it, it by default automatically updates your apps. And that's not always the best thing to do because sometimes an app developer puts something out there that doesn't work. And if you feel like being the, the guinea pig that, you know, finds out when stuff doesn't work, yeah, go ahead, update, mm-hmm. go right ahead. But if you'd rather wait, and find out afterwards that stuff is working correctly, eh, you might want to turn that off. And to do that, you just go into settings in general, and uh, you can change it in under settings on your iOS device. But let's see. Did you do any more work? Did you do any answer any more questions for us? I did. You did? There's do another one. Do you have one. time? We do. Okay. <laughs> cool. Do we have time? Yeah, we have time. Okay. Um, I asked Tom that, and he's like, no, nope, that's all I did. <laughs> yep. Oh, well. I'm an eager beaver. What can I say? Giving you a run for his money. I'm serious. Overachieving firstborn. That's (laughs) me. Um, uh, We actually have a question from Andrea. It's an email. And she said, I was wondering if you know of any places in Jacksonville that buy or recycle old, outdated electronics, such as computers, cell phones, keyboards, hard drives, et cetera. Okay. So do you? I do know of one place in particular. Okay. And that is called eScrap. It is in Jacksonville. And they actually will sometimes, depending on what you've got, they'll pay you by the pound. Oh, okay. <laughs> I know some of those older computers are pretty heavy. Yeah, so that's true. <laughs> you might get five bucks. Um, and they also work with uh, small businesses. So maybe you've come into a new, you know, small business, and they have all this old, outdated equipment. They'll actually come pick it up for you, oh, which okay. is really nice. Do they still pay you if they come pick it up? No, they don't. Ah, okay. <laughs> Oh yeah, I had actually heard of eScrap. I hadn't. Uh, I meant to contact them, um, but I hadn't got a hold of them yet. Um, now, also, uh, we've talked about this before on the show, and uh, also we we talked about this in our radio segment and in our uh, our newspaper article. Uh, in Jacksonville, they will pick up uh, electronic waste um, at the uh, what's it called, the hazardous waste uh, facility. Uh, I don't know if they get any money for that. But I know the city of Jacksonville could probably use the money, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> considering the budget issues and the uh, the broken bridge we have now. Yes. Um, which that did make national news. Uh, if you haven't heard, here in Jacksonville, a ship hit one of our bridges and decommissioned it. And we are a city that has a major river running through it, so and it cuts pretty much down the middle of the city. So losing a bridge is kind of a big deal. Um it's also the bridge that just happened to be next to the Jaguar Stadium. Yes. So, yeah, it looks like it's going to cost $4 million to fix it. And I'm never driving over it again, <laughs> ever. Sorry. Uh, not going to happen. There's a video on YouTube if you want to watch yes. it. Of the thing oh, I hitting haven't the seen bridge. the video. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> when I drove to the station, because we're, we're literally like uh, a few blocks away from that bridge. And uh, when I drove over here the first time, I'm like, there is a chunk missing from that bridge. <laughs> yes. Holy moly. It's pretty bad. So, you know, you, you could give it to the city and maybe they can get some money for it. <laughs> you know, help, them, help them pay off the bridge. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, eScrap, uh, check them out. Uh, you can search. It's uh, scrapcomputers.com is their website. Um, and also on our website at deemable.com uh, under the business directory, there is a company uh, that's listed that takes uh, UPS, uh, un- Uninterrupted Power Supply Batteries. Um, and they will exchange those for you, and they'll pay you for them. So uh, that's a Warritz Energy Systems. Uh, they're here in Jacksonville as well, off of Phillips Highway. Uh, just go to dmobile.com, click on the business directory, and click uh, Small Business Solutions. Uh, and you'll see uh, Jack's computer chick there at the front. I'm right at there. The top. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, down the ways, because it's alphabetical, Warritz is at the bottom. And uh, they So if you have any of those battery backups, which most people don't have in their homes, I do, but I'm a nerd. So do you have one? Do. Some huh? of my clients do. Some of my clients do, yeah. Uh, especially, they sold a lot back in the early 2000s. Yes. Uh, they were good And they're all good starting purchase. to go out about now, so it's a good thing yeah. to know about. Yep. 
and they I believe they will pay you for them. So check them out. Did you do any more work? One more. One more. Okay. <laughs> do we have time? Yeah, sure. Okay, let's do it. All right. Well, Mary, she wrote us and she said that she dropped her precious new <sighs> iPad oh. in a parking lot. Ouch. And it cracked yeah, in three very noticeable do. places. <laughs> she said it didn't really hinder the actual touchscreen abilities, but I don't know if you've seen the commercial where the guy drops his phone and his fingers are bleeding because he's actually oh. scraping them across the glass. Oh. <laughs> so, and I don't That's want that horrible. to happen to Mary. So, sure. um, she actually said how she took her she took her device into Apple, and they actually told her that they were not going to replace the screen. They wanted yeah. to sell her a refurbished iPad for about uh, two hundred and twenty dollars or so. Ooh. And she said, I would like to find a reputable repair s- service, preferably locally, who can repair or replace damaged screen the damaged screen without going broke in the process. Is that possible? I know that going and doing this, I'm voiding my Apple warranty. So in the event that something else goes wrong, but honestly, since Apple's technicians are <laughs> not just full-time warranty specialists, they are, I would probably have to replace the device anyway. So I called a couple of local fixed places, and most of them said they would charge 200 to replace the screen, almost yeah. as much as Apple would charge me for a replacement. Sure. I'm also concerned that some of these may damage the device in the process of replacing the screen. How do I find out if a company is reputable with, and know if they're going to clean me out without cleaning me out? That's a good question, um, and, and that's kind of <laughs> – that's a question that goes across the board. Um, and that's why we tried to start the business directory, and we're working on building that bigger. And we're actually going to add to it uh, where our listeners will be able to rate uh, local businesses like yours and, and others here in Jacksonville. But do you know of any here in Jacksonville that are good for iPad repairs and can give her a price less than that? Because that's about what most places charge is about $200. It depends on the version of the iPad. Okay. And it depends on if um, I believe she had said it was a mini, um, and so of course those can be, Ooh. you know, a little less because it's the size of the screen is smaller, but it's a brand new thing, yeah. so it's going to be a little more. So you kind of have that balanced out. But um, iPhone nine one one is a company okay. here in town, and they have two locations off one off Beach and Hodges and one off of uh, San Jose Boulevard in Mandarin. And they actually have pretty reasonable prices and pretty good hours, um, so you can go after work um, if you needed to. And their service is really fast. I had a repair. I took an iPhone in, and he was done in about 15 minutes. Okay. So, and it was very reasonable. Actually, what the website told me, then when I called, he gave me a, a lower price. Then when I went in, the price was even lower. Oh, that's fantastic. So I was very happy with that. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm not saying that's going to happen for every repair, but... They seem to have extremely reasonable prices, especially even online. Their online prices were pretty reasonable. Okay, cool. There's a couple of other sites uh, here in Jacksonville. I'm not sure on the prices, uh, but you break iFix, mm-hmm. uh, dot com. Uh, ironically, when I was waiting for the iPhone 5S, they were uh, out and about saying hi to everybody and giving business cards. Um, uh, they, I've heard good things about them. Um, I'm not sure if Mac Tech, Mac PC Tech Pro, if they do iPad repair. I don't know if they do. I don't think they do. Um, I know there's one that's off of Beach and Hodges, mm-hmm. and that one is called CPR. Okay. And they also do they do iPhone and iPad screen replacements, and they are a family owned business um, that's a local family, and okay. they have the one store, and um, it's one of those family friendly kind of places that's really nice to go into and. Um, kind of see people who who will get to know you, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. The sad thing is, and this has always been the case with uh, with computer repairs and now mobile phone repairs, is that you know they're run by nerds. I mean, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> generally, unless it's a big corporate company, they're run by nerds, and nerds don't think about decor. They don't think about the 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 presence that a, a store needs to have. So they they kind of come off creepy. <laughs> I mean, you, you don't want to go in. It's like you know, mechanic shops are kind of greasy and dirty. Well. You know, computer repair places are kind of smelly and and dirty. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so and the the biggest thing is is finding out. Uh, talk to people who have actually used their service. That's how you can find out if they're reputable. Because there are some great repair places mm-hmm. that don't look great on the outside, mm-hmm. and uh, maybe aren't the most comfortable place to go into. But they're really fantastic service, and they really do a great they do a great job. And the opposite. You know, yes. places that are really fantastic looking, but they're going to charge you a crazy price and they're not that great. So, yeah. 
Uh, it, it really just comes down to find people who know, uh, who've used the service personally. Yes. And the prices, you just got to kind of shop around yep. and see. So good luck with that. Uh, I have not experienced it personally, but I know people who have dealt with it, and it's not fun. Elizabeth, yes. did you answer any more questions? No, did I'm you? done. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Tom, you, you got you got your work cut out for you, man. <laughs> she, she's a hard worker. Uh, uh, you might be uh, looking for a new job. Maybe one where they pay you. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, that is all the questions that we have for for today or this week. Thanks for all your questions. Keep them coming. Call us at our toll-free number. It's 1-888-972-9868. Or you can send us an email at questions at deemable.com. Our producer is Sean Birch. I'm Ray Hollister. And I'm Elizabeth Pampalone. And this is Deemable Tech. Thanks for listening and have a great week. 